What's up, I'm Vin, and today I want to go through an AP Calculus BC Unit 10 practice test. I'll leave a link to a copy of this test in the description below. Now let's get started. So first up here, we want to know which of the following series converges. And for the multiple choice, you could do a lot of these in your head if you know your convergence test. So for the first one, I rewrite this as 1 over k to the 1 fourth power like this. And then I look at this and say, this is a P series where the power is 1 fourth, which is less than or equal to 1, which tells us that this series diverges. And that means we could eliminate it as an answer choice. And moving on here, we could rewrite this one as 1 over k to the 1 half power. And this is another P series where we have P equals a half, which is less than or equal to 1. So B is out. Now, just looking at choice C, I could see that this one is good right away because what I'm thinking of here is just the leading terms here. If I were to just look at these, I would have the series one over two k squared, which I could rewrite as one half times the series we have one over k squared like this. And this would be a convergent p series. We'd have p equals two, which is greater than one. If I wanted to show more work, I would use the limit comparison test. But since this is just the multiple choice, just look at the leading terms. And if the leading terms give you a convergent p-series, then you're good here. Now, looking at the last one, why is the last one no good? Well, if we look at just the leading terms, we're looking at just the series of k squared over k to the third, which simplifies to just 1 over k, which would be the harmonic series, which is known to diverge. So choice C is our solution. So question two, which of the following series diverges? And for the first one here, we could use the nth term test. Even though our series is in terms of k, we take the limit as k goes to infinity of the general term here. And what we have to do here to do this limit, we just have to know here that the leading terms have matching powers. So we're just going to take the ratio of their coefficients. And since our limit is 2 thirds, and this is not equal to zero, by the nth term test, we could say the first series here is going to diverge. So this has to be part of our answer. So choice C is out. And now for this one here, what you really want to know, you could do the ratio test to show that this converges, and that would eliminate this. So we can do the ratio test, but since it's multiple choice, we could go faster. And just be mindful here that k factorial increases at a much faster rate than 2 to the k power. Because if you think of this one, this is k times k minus 1 times k minus 2. And this would go on and on and on to like, let's say, 3 times 2 times 1. And if we compare it to 2 to the k power, this is just equal to a string of 2s like this. So you could see here that up until the first two terms here, these expressions are the same, but then once we get past 2, notice that k factorial, it's 3 versus 2, and then it's 4 versus 2, and so on like this. So this is way more powerful. And if you're dividing by something way more powerful, factorials will always beat exponentials. This is going to converge. So Roman numeral 2 is out. And now this one you may recognize, this is the alternating harmonic series which is known to converge. So this is the alternating harmonic series, and this is known to converge, so this one is out. If I had to argue this, though, the long way, like I would in a free response, I would use the alternating series test here to show that this converges by showing that the limit as k goes to infinity of the non-negative part here, 1 over k, is going to 0, and the sequence of terms here, 1 over k, is decreasing. So if we had to write more of an argument here, we could show why Roman numeral 3 does converge, but this is sufficient for the multiple choice that this is just the, harm, the alternating harmonic series. So one is the only one that will diverge. So choice A is our answer. So for question three, we have to know how to evaluate a geometric series. And if your geometric series converges, it converges to A over one minus R, where this is your first term. So we're going to use this idea to simplify this. So the first thing we could do is break this up. We have the series from n equals zero to infinity of three over five to the n plus, and then we rewrite our series like this, we're going to have 2 to the n over 5 to the n. So I'm just breaking this up into two individual series here. And now I could rewrite the first one. This is going to be equal to, we have the series from n equals 0 to infinity. I'm going to write this as 3 times 1 fifth to the n power. So now it's looking geometric. And the second one I'm going to rewrite, we have the series from n equals 0 to infinity of 2 fifths to the n. So now using this trick that I just talked about over here, we want to think about what is the first term of the first series. And if we have 3 times 1 fifth to the n, we're going to start at n equals 0. We have 3 times 1 fifth to the 0, which will be equal to 3 times 1 or just 3. So this is going to be 3 over 1 minus the, uh, the ratio here or the uh, common ratio of our geometric series is 1 fifth. So now we just have to evaluate this. And then we have plus our first term of our second series we're going to think about over here is going to be 2 fifths, and we're starting at n equals 0. So our first term of the second series is going to be 1 over, and then we have 1 minus the common ratio here is 2 fifths. 
And be mindful that both of these series will converge because the absolute value of their R values is less than one. So now we just have to simplify. This is three over one minus one fifth is four fifths. And then we have plus one over one minus two over five is gonna give us three over five like this. And now we just simplify. This is gonna be equal to, we're gonna have three times five over four, which is gonna give us 15 over four. And now we have plus five thirds like this. So now we just have to make common denominators. So I'll do that work off to the side over here. We're gonna multiply this one by three over three and we're gonna get 45 over 12 plus two times four over four, and you're gonna get 20 over 12. And now when you add these two, 45 plus 20 is 65, and we're over 12. So just scan the answer choices. Choice C is our solution. So question four, we have a telescoping series. And for this one, you wanna notice a pattern here. So what I would do is look for the nth partial sum. So notice that we have the first partial sum, that's just gonna be one over one, and then minus, we have one over one plus one is a half. So that would be if we just plug in k equals one. But if we want to find the second partial sum, we would plug in k equals one and k equals two. So I'd have one minus a half, that's the first partial sum here. Plus, if we plug in k equals two, we have a half minus two plus one on bottom gives us a third. So then you might start to notice the trend here. And if we keep this going, I'll just do one more. So then hopefully then we see the pattern. We have everything that we just wrote before. And now we're going to tack on the next thing would be one third minus a fourth. But the pattern here is that each of these terms are going to cancel out and we're gonna be left with the first thing minus the last thing. So you see all the inside stuff cancels because we have a half minus a half, we have negative a third plus a third, and we're just left with the first thing minus the last thing. So the nth partial sum would be one minus one over and be mindful here. If the subscript was three, the trailing denominator was a four, so it's just one more than the subscript. So this would be one minus one over n plus one. And now just know here that the sum, the actual sum is the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth partial sum. So this we could just say is the limit as n goes to infinity of we have one minus one over n plus one. And this limit here, if we work this out, so I'll just section this off over here. This limit, you could see that one over n plus one as n goes to infinity goes to zero. So we have one minus zero, which is gonna be one. And choice D is our solution. So question five, which infinite series can be tested for convergence using a P-series test? So for the first one here, if we explore this a little bit more, we should package this up in summation form. So we have to look for the pattern here. And to get from one term to the next, we're just multiplying by half. So this is looking like a geometric series here. So right away, I'm seeing that one is no good because if we repackage this, we could express this as the series from n equals zero to infinity of one half to the n power like this. And once again, this is not a p-series, this is a geometric series. So we could show this converges using a geometric series test, but we're not gonna be using a p-series test. So one is out. And now looking at the second one, the second one could be repackaged. And let's see, how are we gonna repackage this? This is looking like the series from n equals zero to infinity. And all of the terms on bottom are are perfect squares. So this is looking like one over n squared. And let's see, we're gonna be starting here at n equals one. So sometimes you're starting at zero, sometimes you're starting at one. N equals zero would be no good because we'd have one over zero, which is undefined. But if we start at one, you could start to see here, we would have one over one squared plus one over two squared is one fourth plus one ninth, and then so on, and it matches this. And this is a convergent P-series. So this one here, we can test for convergence using the P-series test. So two is good. And now the third one, notice this could be repackaged Roman numeral three, we could rewrite as the series from n equals zero to infinity of one over square root of n. And this, once again, I'm always, my instinct is always to start at zero, but I would erase here and say, hey, I'm gonna start at one because if I divide by zero, that's no good. And this one here is a divergent P-series, but be careful here. The question is saying, which of the following infinite series can be tested for convergence? They're not saying which one does converge, which one can be tested for convergence using a P-series test. And this one could be expressed as one over n to the half. So we can test Roman numeral three for convergence using a P-series test. This will diverge, but it can be tested for convergence using a P-series test. So choice C is our answer. So question six, we're gonna find the interval of convergence. And before we do that, I wanna do a little bit of algebra. I wanna rewrite x to the two n as x to the second raised to the n power. Because when we make substitutions in a moment, this is just gonna make it easier to simplify. So we're finding the radius of convergence and we don't have to do the ratio test. This is multiple choice. We could get away with just plugging in. But one thing I wanna be mindful of is that the center of our power series is gonna be at zero because that's the x value that makes everything zero. 
So I know right away this is our center. And if we look at the answer choices, notice how we're either going to be between negative 3 and 3, or we're going to be between negative 9 and 9. So what I would do here is I'm going to plug in the least restrictive case here. I'm going to plug in, let's say, something like x equals 9 and see what that gives us. So if we plug in 9 to our power series, what we're going to have here is I'm going to rewrite this with the algebra that I just did as the series from n equals 1 to infinity. And we're going to have x to the second to the n power like this over, we, we're going to have n times 9 to the n power like this. So that now when I want to plug in x equals 9, this is going to give us, we're going to have the series from n equals 1 to infinity of we have 9 to the second power to the n over n times 9 to the n like this. And this is going to work out to we're going to have 81 like this to the n power over 9 to the n. And then a little bit more algebra that's useful here. When you have a to the c over b to the c, you can combine these into a single fraction, a over b to the c power. So what I have here is I'm going to have, I'm going to have 81 to the n over 9 to the n. So that I'll just clean up in one, in one shot like this. So this is going to be 81 to the n over 9 to the n. This is going to simplify as a single expression. We're going to have 9 to the n over n. And if you just use the nth term test for divergence, this series is going to diverge because the numerator is increasing at a much faster rate than the denominator. So the general term is going to infinity. So the whole series diverges. So what that tells me right away is that this is not going to be the answer. And that tells us all real numbers is not going to be the answer. Now, I know that, let's say, 8 wouldn't work because 9 sent us so far over. If we wound up with 1 over n, then I would still consider this as a contender here. But once again, because we got something so restricting like this, I know right away that these two choices are out. So now it's going to be between choices a and b. So for this one, I'm just going to plug in x equals negative 3 because if this works, if x equals negative 3 gives us a convergent series, then a is our answer. So if we plug this in, what we're going to have here, we have the series from n equals 1 to infinity. And now we're going to have negative 3 squared to the n over, we have n times 9 to the n like this. And this is going to be the series we have from n equals 1 to infinity. And we're going to have 9 to the n over n times 9 to the n. And notice what we get here. These terms cancel out. And now we just have the series from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n, which is the harmonic series which diverges. So that tells us right away that this choice is out. Choice B has to be our solution. Now, if you really want to play this safe, what you could do is you could plug in a number between 3 and 9, like let's say x equals 7. And that would give you this series here, which you see we have 49 to the n versus 9 to the n. This series is going to diverge. So this is just extra confirmation here that choice C is no good. So we don't necessarily have to test the n point 9. We could plug in a number between 3 and 9 to rule out choice C. So B is definitely our solution. So question seven, we want the interval of convergence again, and we have this infinite series. So for this one, what I would do is I would package this up in sigma form. So we have the series from n equals one to infinity, and this is gonna work out to x to the n over n. And the way I know this is I see that the power of x matches the denominator underneath it. So this will capture what's going on here. So once again, we could use the ratio test, or we could just plug in test values here and see which one is going to give us the correct answer. So right away, I could see that choice D is out because if I were to plug in something like, let's say, x equals a half, that would give me the series we have one half to the n divided by n. So in a sense, it's like I have a geometric series that's being divided by n. So it's just going to converge even faster as if it was just one half to the n by itself. So that's how I know D is out because something like X equals one half gives us something good. But now I would plug in, let's say I plug in X equals one, that's gonna give me the series, we have one to the n, which is one over n, and this diverges because this is the harmonic series. So X equals one is not, con is not included in our solution. So C is out. And now if we plug in X equals negative one, this is just like what happened before. We're gonna have the series of negative one to the n over n, and this will converge by the alternating series test. So that tells us negative one is included in our answer. Choice B is our solution. For something like eight, you have to show up to the AP test knowing the Maclaurin series for e to the x, for sine x, and for cosine x. And for e to the x, this is simply the Maclaurin series for e to the x. So this is something, once again, that you should just show up to the AP test. This should just be common knowledge here. And now what you're gonna do is when you wanna talk about the Taylor series for e to the three x, you're just gonna replace every x with a 3x. So instead here, you're going to have 1 plus blank plus blank squared over 2 factorial plus we have blank to the third over 3 factorial and so on like this. So when we plug in 3x, 
the three X is going to go in all of these blank spaces here. And let's just color code this. We'll make this in red. So we have three X here. We have a three X here, a three X here, and one more like this. But we only care about the X to the second term. So that means we're just targeting this piece here. And if we simplify this piece, we're going to have three to the second power is nine. X to the second power is X to the second power. And on bottom, two factorial is two times one, which is two. And this works out nine divided by two is 4.5. So we'd have 4.5 X squared. The coefficient of X squared is choice C, 4.5. So question nine is Lagrange error bound. We have a third degree Taylor polynomial for F centered at zero. And we have a graph of the absolute value of the fourth derivative over here. And we're on the interval from zero to three. Of the following answer choices, what is the smallest value of K for which the Lagrange error bound guarantees that this inequality here is true. So for the Lagrange error bound stuff, what I think of, because these questions can be a little bit complicated, they do tend to confuse students, but I just think of the most important pieces here. And we have a center at zero and our X value that's being plugged into the function. Notice that we're evaluating the function at X equals a half. So the center is zero, our X value that we're plugging in is a half. So we are just thinking about this space here from zero to a half. So that's what I'm focusing on when I'm thinking about these questions is what's going on from zero to a half. So when you think about the Z value here is the value that makes the derivative as large as possible. So the Z value in this case would actually be the same as the center because notice that this portion of the graph from zero to a half, the maximum value of the derivative here is equal to four. So this is something here that's gonna be very important for the question. Now, the bear trap here is that a lot of students are gonna look and say, what is the maximum of the entire portion of the graph? And they're gonna pick their derivative value to be up here at five. But once again, you were only focusing on this little space here from zero to a half. So now we could go ahead and evaluate this. What we have here is that n is equal to three. So for n equals three, we have the absolute value of f of one half, that's our x value, minus the third degree Taylor polynomial at one half is less than or equal to, and now we have the max value of the n plus one derivative. So we have the max value of the fourth derivative at uh, our z value is what makes the fourth derivative as maximum as possible. We have x is one half minus c is equal to zero to the n plus one. We have n equals three. So we're gonna have the fourth power here over three plus one is four, and we have our factorial. But once again, the fourth derivative at z, z is a number that's between zero and a half. That makes the fourth derivative at this location as large as possible. So our max value here, we're going to set equal to four. So now we're just going to say less than or equal to, we have the absolute value of four times one half to the fourth power is going to simplify to one over 16. And now we're dividing everything by four factorial. Four factorial is equal to, we have four times three times two times one. So this is equal to 24. So now we just simplify this here. Four over 24 simplifies to one over six. And if we do one over 16 divided by six, that's gonna be one over 96 here. So what we have is that our error here, our Lagrange error bound, we're less than or equal to one over 96. So that is going to be our smallest value of K. Now, once again, let's say a student had incorrectly chosen their max value of the derivative to be five, there will be an answer choice waiting for you. If you were to do instead five times and you'd have one half to the fourth power like this, and you're still dividing by four factorial, this one would work out to we would have five over, one half to the fourth was one over 16, and we would have 16 times 24 on bottom, and this would work out to five over 384. So choice C is a very dangerous trap. So question 10 is our final multiple choice question, and we're going to evaluate this definite integral expressing our answer as a power series. So for this one, you want to be mindful that 1 over 1 minus x could be expressed as this power series from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n power. So what you need to do for something like this is you need to know what you know about power series, the common ones, and you need to build that expression using common knowledge about power series. So this is one that you should show up to the AP test knowing. So when I want to write 1 over 1 plus t to the fourth, I could express that as one over one minus negative t to the fourth like this. And now this as a power series, I could express as the series from n equals zero to infinity. And now instead of x to the n, I have minus t to the fourth raised to the n power like this. And now I could just do that algebra on the side. Negative t to the four raised to the n could be expressed as negative one to the n times, we have t to the four raised to the n. And this could be expressed as negative one to the n 
times t to the 4n like this. So that's what I want to do in the next line. And now the left side I could just write as 1 over 1 plus t to the 4th. And this is equal to, we did the algebra on the side. We have the series from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times we have t to the 4n like this. So now we could do the calculus. We're going to integrate from 0 to x and we tack on the dt. And we're going to do the same thing on the right side, the integral from 0 to x and we tack on the dt. But just know when you integrate a power series, you are only integrating with respect to the variable of the integral. So you see how we have a dt? We're just going to be targeting the t to the 4n. And since this is t to a number power, we're going to use the power rule. And now I'm just going to write this simplification on the side. I'm going to leave the left side alone. We're going to have now the power series from n equals 0 to infinity. And we have negative 1 to the n. And we apply the power rule. We have t to the 4n plus 1. And we're dividing by, we have 4n plus 1, that new exponent. And now we could drop the dt, and we're going to use our brackets here to indicate we're going from 0 to x. And now this we simplify. We have the series from n equals 0 to infinity. We have negative 1 to the n over, we have 4 to the n plus 1. The constants I'm going to leave alone, but the variable t is the one that we have to make the substitution for. So we're going to have inside here, we're going to have x to the power 4n plus 1 and we're gonna have minus zero to the power four n plus one. Now this piece will just cancel out here nice. This is just gonna wipe out. So now our final answer here, all simplified, we're gonna have the series from n equals zero to infinity. We have negative one to the n, we have x to the four n plus one on top, and underneath all of it, we're gonna have four n plus one. So now we just scan the answer choices, and this is looking like choice A. So for part two, we have a free response question and calculator use is not permitted. So for this one, we have a power series defined by, we have f of x here, and we have the first four terms and the general term here. And we want to use the ratio test to find the interval of convergence for f of x. We need to justify our answer. So we just have to be able to show the work here. We can't just plug in numbers like we did in the multiple choice. So for the ratio test, what you want to do is you want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the a sub n plus one term over the a sub n term in the absolute value here like this. So just know our a sub n term is negative one to the n, x to the two n times two n plus one. So then what we're gonna do here with this is we have to be able to express our a sub n plus one term. So this is a little bit of algebra, but we're gonna write this as negative one to the n plus one. And then we have to be careful here. We have x to the two n, but we can't just say two n plus one. We have to put the n plus one in parentheses. And inside this here, we have two times n plus one plus one. So when you're simplifying, just be careful with these little substitutions. A common mistake, once again, is students just write x to the 2n plus one. So now we are going to divide. We have a sub n plus one on top. So I'm just applying the ratio test. We're going to have negative one to the n plus one. And now this expression is going to give us x to the 2n plus two. And then over here, we have 2n plus two plus one is going to give us 2n plus three. And we're dividing by a sub n. So a sub n underneath is going to be negative 1 to the n, and we have x to the 2n, and then we have 2n plus 1. So for this part here, you just want to think about how things are going to simplify. So here, negative 1 to the n cancels out completely, and this gives us negative 1 to the first on top. And if I were to simplify x to the 2n plus 2 over x to the 2n, notice that the top has a power that's higher by two units here. So this will cancel out completely and we'll be left with a power of two on top. If you have to, you could use law of exponents here that a to the b over a to the c is a to the b minus c. But otherwise you could just do this algebra quickly. So now this I'm going to express, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of, and the absolute value of one could just disappear. The only thing that's gonna have to remain behind so far in the absolute value is absolute value of x squared. But the two n plus three over two n plus one we could take out because n is going to infinity, so we're going to have two positive expressions here, and the absolute value of something positive, you just drop the absolute value sign like this. But now we could be mindful that the absolute value of x squared is just x squared, because x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. So even at this step, we could drop the absolute value around the x squared. And for the ratio test to show convergence, we need to set everything here to be less than one. But first, what we could do is we could find the limit as n goes to infinity. And notice what we have here is we have leading terms that have matching coefficients and they have matching powers of n. So the limit is only affecting the terms with n's. This limit is going to one. So we could say this is equal to the absolute value of x squared, which we could just say is equal to x squared. And we're setting this to be less than one. But now if you think about this inequality here, x squared is less than one. 
when we are between negative one and one. So our interior interval of convergence right now, this tells us that our interior interval of convergence is gonna be, we have negative one is less than X, which is less than one. So now let's check the endpoints. But before we do, let's define F of X in sigma form. We have the series from N equals zero to infinity. And we're gonna write the A sub N term here, the negative one to the N. We have X to the two N times 2n plus 1. Now, just to be safe, I'm going to check n equals 0 and n equals 1 to make sure they give us this. So I would just plug these in in my head. Negative 1 to the 0 is 1, x to the 0 is 1, and 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. So the first term checks out. If you plugged in n equals 1, you'd have negative 1 to the first is negative 1 times x to the 2 times 1 is x squared, and then 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. So that's matching this. So this is looking good. So now we could proceed, and we're going to plug in the first endpoint. We have x equals negative 1. And if you plug that into the series, you're going to have the series from n equals 0 to infinity of we have negative 1 to the n. And if we did negative 1 to the 2n, just be mindful here that negative 1 to the 2n, 2n is always even if n is a whole number. So this is always going to result in just positive 1. So I don't have to write the negative 1 to the 2n here. I could just write this. But now if we were to use the nth term test for divergence, take the limit as n goes to infinity of this term. This is going to infinity, and this is bouncing between 1 and negative 1. So that's not going to go to 0. So we could say this diverges. And I would just say which test I use. This is the nth term test. You don't have to show every gritty detail here, because then this would just take up like a whole page for this one part here. But this is sufficient here when you're arguing the endpoints converging or diverging. And now we're going to plug in the other endpoint uh, at x equals 1. And we're going to have the series here from n equals 0 to infinity. And we're going to have negative 1 to the n. If you plug in 1, you're going to have 1 times 2n plus 1. And this is the matching thing as before. So we have this diverges. And for the same argument, uh, the same argument that this is the nth term test that we're using to show it diverges. So now our interval of convergence, if we want to write our answer formally here, our interval is going to be from negative 1 to positive 1, not including the endpoints. So this is our solution to part A. So for part B, we want the first four terms and the general term for the infinite series that represents h of x. And h of x is defined here as the integral from 0 to x of f of t. So there is more than one way to do this. But one way you could do this is write the integral from 0 to x. And then f of t on the inside, you could just plug in everything we have here. But instead of x, put a t. So we have 1 minus 3t squared. And we have plus 5t to the fourth minus 7t. And let's make that neater. Minus 7t to the sixth plus this goes on, we have negative 1 to the n, then we're going to have t to the 2n times 2n plus 1. And then this will continue on and on. We'll throw in our bracket and then tack on our dt here. So let's start to work this out. h of x is equal to, we're going to anti-derive. So we have the anti-derivative of 1 is t minus, we're going to have 3t to the third over 3. And this is going to cancel. And then you might start to notice the trend here, that this is going to be 5t to the fifth over 5. So this will just be t to the fifth. So this, the pattern is that now there's going to be no more coefficients other than 1 and negative 1. And these are just going to be all odd powers. So when we get to the end here, this is going to be plus, we have negative 1 to the n, we're going to have t to the 2n plus 1. The 2n plus 1 stays here, but we're dividing by this new power 2n plus 1, which is going to cancel this part out. This goes on and on, but we are evaluating this from 0 to x. So if we want to write h of x here in terms of x, now we could go ahead and plug in. And be mindful, when we plug in x for t, that's just going to switch this to x. When we plug in 0, it's going to wipe everything out. So now we could just write this. We have x minus x to the third plus x to the fifth minus x to the seven. Here's the first four terms. And now the general term is coming up. We have plus negative 1 to the n. We have x to the 2n plus 1. And then this is going to continue on like this. So here's our first four terms. So this is the first four terms. And our general term here, this is our general term. So for part C, we're going to use this result from before to find h of 1 third. So the first thing I'm going to do is write h of x in sigma form here. So we have the series from n equals 0 to infinity. And let's just write the general term on the inside like this. So what I would do, though, before I move on is make sure that if I plugged in n equals 0, that it's going to give me the first term. So negative 1 to the 0 would give me the 1 in front. And if I plugged in 0 here, I would have x to the first. So this is looking good. And now we can move forward here. Now this, the key is that h of 1 third is going to be a geometric series. So I want to rewrite this in a way that it's easy to identify what the common ratio is. So this, I'm going to do some algebra. I have x to the 2n plus 1. I could write as x to the 2n 
times x to the first. And then this I could express as x to the second to the n power like this times x to the first. So you'll see why this is important. We rewrite this. We have the series from n equals zero to infinity. We've got negative one to the n, and we're going to have x to the second to the n times x to the first. So now let's plug in. We have h to the one third power, and this is going to be equal to, we have the series from n equals zero to infinity, and we've got negative one to the n, and we're going to have instead of x, x is one third, and that's being squared and raised to the n like this. And then what we have after this is x to the first. So we're just going to plug in one third one more time. So now I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. This is the series from n equals zero to infinity. And just know here that one third squared is one ninth. So this makes one ninth. And if I do something like this, if I have a to the c times b to the c, this is the same thing as a times b to the c. So I could combine these two. I'm going to have one ninth times negative one, giving me negative one ninth to the n power. And this is being multiplied by this, this one third on the outside. So remember what I said before, that when you're evaluating a geometric series, it's just equal to the first term over one minus the common ratio. And our common ratio here is negative one ninth. And our first term, if you think about this, if you were to plug in n equals zero to this series, you see how you'd have negative one ninth to the zero times one third. And this would just give us one third. So our first term here is gonna be one third and we're dividing by one minus our common ratio is negative one ninth. So when we divide here, we're gonna have one third divided by one plus one ninth, and that's nine over nine plus one over nine. So that's gonna be one third divided by, we're gonna have 10 over nine. And this we could just leave alone, but let's go ahead and simplify. This is one third times nine over 10. And then nine divided by three is three. So this simplifies to three tenths. Here's our solution to part C. For part D, we have to show that this inequality holds true and we're gonna justify our answer. Now, this is gonna be the alternating series error bound. H of one third represents the actual value of the function. Eight over 27 is an approximation. So we need to figure out how far did they go out to get this approximation. And then we have to use the alternating series error bound to show that it's within one over 240 of the actual answer. So for this, let's first comment on H of one third is equal to, we would have one third minus one third to the third power, plus we have one third to the fifth power and minus and so on like this, that this is an alternating series where the terms decrease in magnitude to zero. So now for the next stage of this question, we wanna figure out how far did they go out to get an approximation of eight over 27. So one thing to comment here is that eight over 27 is equal to, if we just plugged in one third for the first thing, Obviously, these two are not equal to each other. But if you were to plug in one third one more time and do one third minus one third to the third power, let's see how this works out. We have one third minus one over three to the third power is 27. And if you multiply this first fraction by nine over nine, you're going to get nine over 27 minus one over 27. And this is equal to eight over 27. So now we know that this approximation was found using the first two terms of this alternating series. So we could use the alternating series error bound to say that our error is going to be equal to at most the absolute value of the third term evaluated at x equals one third. So now we could use the alternating series error bound formula and be mindful here. Once again, the third term is our first unused term here because eight over 27 was approximated using the first two terms. So now we're just gonna set this up. We have the absolute value of h of one third minus eight over 27 is now less than or equal to the first unused term is x to the fifth. So we take the absolute value of x to the fifth and we're gonna substitute in x equals one third. And now this simplifies one over three to the fifth works out to one over 243. And watch what we have here. Our denominator is greater than this denominator. So we could say that this is within one over 240 of the actual answer. And here's our solution to part D.